Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today is a bit of an unusual program. I had originally intended to have a conversation with my guest, Dr. Bruce Damer, about the destiny of life and consciousness, focusing in on his work with NASA to develop uh, computer simulations of space missions. He has even designed spacecraft for the purpose of harvesting asteroids. Uh, he is a polymath. You may remember our previous interview in which we discussed his many interests, including the origins of life itself. Uh, he developed this theory with uh, my old friend, Professor David Deemer at the University of California at Santa Cruz. It was featured on the cover of Scientific American a few years ago. He is also one of the pioneers in the field of virtual reality and is the author of the book, Avatar. He maintains a museum of ancient now, <laughs> one might even call them antique, but they're not that old, but the history of computer technology. He also maintains the archives for counterculture figures like Timothy Leary and Terence McKenna. Truly an amazing individual, but I was very surprised because when we began our discussion, Bruce informed me that something else was on his mind and the conversation turned to the subjects of universal love and a concept known to the Buddhists as Dharma Kaya. So uh, I'm going to switch over now to the internet video and you'll see for yourself how this amazing conversation, truly one of the most interesting that I've ever had, let's see how it unfolds. So we'll, um, we'll talk today about space exploration and see where that leads us. Well, I actually, I'm in a slightly different mood Oh, all uh, right. I'm I'm in a more soft, flowy, mystical mood than a, a hardcore techie mood. Oh, okay. I, the this Sunday I went through a major um, personal experience, which was a uh, sometimes called Dharmakaya in the Bon Buddhist tradition, mm -hmm. and it's it's caused a whole opening of my system. And, and this was part of the oh. luminous the luminous program that that I've been in for four years. It's a, a healing arts awakening school. No, you haven't talked to me about that yet. I didn't know you were involved in uh, such a program. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's um, more and more what I'm talking about these days, and it's science and non duality. Mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce. Uh, the, they've invited the, the primary teachers from Luminous, and I'm going to introduce them to the community uh, in October. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's a whole other side of me that uh, I, I started to talk about it at, on Chris Ryan's podcast about a year ago. Um, and it, it's the it's the parts work. Sometimes you probably know all this stuff: internal family systems. Uh, the the practices around uh, wounds inner inner wounds that we get when we're we're very young mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, and it to 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 my thinking uh, for some new kinds of thinking it's really the boot up operating system of humans uh, and our entire world is shaped by the conditioning of these in, inner parts these little children mm -hmm. running around and. So I, I, I've been on this path for a couple of decades through the, my own healing, uh, actually since mm -hmm. the eighties, cause I was adopted. I was given up at birth and it, oh. it let, it left a strong imprint. Uh, sure. That started out as, an, and we can probably even start the show around that, around my origins and trying to heal that hard knot. Of, uh, okay. Of an imprint. 
Well, let's just keep let's just keep going, and and we'll take it from here. You could sort of even open it with a question. You know, we've we've heard about your your a lot about your science and your te- technical mm. yeah. your, your, <laughs> me, your mental space. What about the real Bruce? Yeah. Where, where did where did Bruce come from? You know that. Kind Sure. I, I mean, we did this whole introductory lecture about uh, your professional interests, and, and which are enormous, but we didn't really touch uh, at all on the personal side, and I, except to say that you had used entheogens. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so, I, I'm just honored that you're willing to, to talk about these other things with me now, Bruce. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm in a kind of soft mood this week because um, a soft state because of the beautiful spring rains, but also because of uh, an experience that I had on Sunday with our what's called our Luminous Awareness Institute group, uh, which is a really advanced healing and awakening school uh, that's been doing its work for about 12 years. And I joined four years ago. And we just finished a two-year program. And the experience was, if you, if you can think that it, in all the history of the healing arts, uh, often there's been a teacher there or a guide or a mentor mm-hmm. or even to some degree like icons and spirit animals and things like that. There's been an other. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and why, should we care about healing? Why should we care about the little wounds that are inside of us? Because those wounds pattern and they create a system. Now, here I am back in tech talk. Uh, <laughs> but but they, they create a little internal society. I sometimes call it the inner kindergarten inside mm. each of us. And, they're, and these these beings, if you will, run around and they fashion what some would call the personality or our responses to the world. And to a large extent, the, the structure that emerges is not us. And all through the ages, the great sages and teachers and, and even the, the jokesters have commented that none of this is you. Uh, what you are is, you know, the Atman meets Brahman in one tradition. Mm-hmm. Or you are uh, a droplet in the sea of consciousness. You are uh, mm. a piece of God, or in fact, you may be just an instantiation of what some might call God or super energy mm. or super mind, instantiated in a in a body in a form patterned by experiences from from our lineage and from our youth and our shaping and our environment and you're just this beautiful instantiation or piece of art in the world like a sculpture or a painting or a song and you come into this world and you play a role you know the shakespeare saying we we strut on the stage only briefly something like that Mm -hmm. Um, but all of that you are a droplet from sort of the cosmic uh, miracle and that's what I experienced on Sunday um, mm. in, and I've I've been there before in different ways but this was special mm-hmm. you, you empty of form you empty of emotion and structure and then the energy and I could feel it is it's really roaring now it's it and the energy comes through and the energy starts to work when you detach and become an open space for it. And I I left that session, which was just a 10 or 15 minute session, uh, realizing that I felt held by this energy, that I had a relationship for the first time to this force in the universe that everyone talks about, that I had a personal relationship. I could feel it as a being. And it's, I think in Christian traditions, they call it feeling saved or reborn. In other traditions, there are different words for it. But I felt for the first time, I wasn't an isolated, bobbing little being in a great ocean of 
separation, that there was something else was blowing me up, that was literally holding me. And as, as I walked across the Ananda Retreat Center where we, where we do our work, it was rolling, continuously rolling through the system. It was like a, in, in, in ayahuasca traditions, you can feel this healing power. But this was completely a, it wasn't a plant medicine, it was a human medicine. It was something else. It was not from uh, any exogenous source. It was, maybe it is all exogenous, but maybe it's all one anyway. But it was so powerful, Jeff. And uh, I, I'm still, the one thing on the on the way out, because I know myself well, you know thyself, they say, um, is that I knew that when you have a healing like this, when something is such so potent, it, it heals so many of the internal wounds, it resolves so many things so quickly, you get a burst of energy, you get a burst of capability. So, of course, when I get back from there, I'm just working and doing project after project. I mean, I'm super productive. And I know that when I do that, when that, that comes in, I can drown that healing Mm. because often Mm. these healings need a slow wave they need sitting they need contemplation they need being with to set to integrate because of course what i do is i could i could do anything now you know and all i take on all these tasks and whatnot so i knew that this was my predilection and so i asked the field itself the energy or whatever system it was to please stay with me and remind me that this is going on, and you are still there. Tug on my little string now and then and be present and help me to not forget. Help me to to let this land. And truthfully, it's been there all week. And our recording two days ago uh, was so clear and so smooth because of that, that healing and because that energy is still flowing. And I just wanted to share that with the the viewers um, that this is something I'm I'm undergoing at, at the moment. Well, I and I can feel it. It's quite tangible to me, just uh, being with you and and not just listening with my ears, but listening with my heart. It's it's very obvious. Uh, what surprises me is that that I didn't pick up on it on Wednesday. Today is Friday uh, when we spoke, and you had this initial experience on Sunday. So it's really been with you now for nearly a week, which I think is quite significant. Sometimes in our lives, we encounter something so powerful and profoundly good from the universe. And if we ask, if we say, we don't know what we're doing. You know, we, we, we can't navigate this thing. We can't, we can't sit on our pillow and do our morning practices alone and figure this out. And we just give up. We say, please help this little being. You know, some part of us may say, well, you're not good enough to ask for help. You know, or another wounded part might say, uh, you can't, you'll never feel it. You know, and that's, there's all these different different processes that might block that but when you give up on all that and i think this is what happened to a lot of people through history they just gave up on striving on on efforting but and they became a complete collapsed system in some way and they just like you know and it's hard to say this but some of the most beautifully liberated people that i've ever met are those that have just received a really bad diagnosis of a disease or a cancer because at some point and this happened to my biological father uh literally close to his death uh about eight nine years ago i had a call with him uh and he was in the hospital and it's actually the last time i heard his voice and he is he said the pain is gone the pain is gone i can't believe it the pain is gone And it had left him. I had no idea of the trauma, the wound that this man had been carrying all his life. I mean, he he drunk a lot. He was hard to reach. uh, All these things. There was a beautiful being in there, and there was a huge shell of damage there. But he was liberated in that moment, and he was in a hospital bed, and his organs were failing, and 
all that left and he felt for the first time the lack of the, the his pain had been removed mm. um and it, it it it's a shame you know to have that release or that freedom come so so late in life uh after so much suffering it sounds like what you're saying is you you feel some pain lifting yourself right now it, there's a flow that is going and in that flow is a, a super intelligence. You know, there's a, the irony of me and my work, and you're kind of, you can kind of get at it now, and the comments that we've gotten from those wonderful listeners is, yes, I'm a hardcore materialist. I'm a reductionist. Uh, but I'm an experientialist. I'm, I'm still, in a sense, uh, how to say this, I mean, I sound like a, a, a mystic far on the other scale of, of what you might call no. the woo, the woo meter. And because in a sense, uh, we can't pin ourselves down to mechanistic approaches. However, I would offer that this intelligent energy that we can feel and we can use on a daily basis to work with, with human systems. You know, I don't think I can move a coin, you know, one centimeter with my mind, but with human mm. systems, human to human interaction, very powerful and almost Jedi like or sci fi like things happen continuously. Uh, just in human interactions alone, just, just the synchronous energies of our friend Nick arriving and showing me how to make a, a hardwood floor out of plywood. So we don't have mm. to spend a month putting in oak floors and like uh, him arriving at the precise moment when this this concept can come in it's like the synchronous field and the intelligence guiding me forward at the exact moment and mm. and this thing is powerful and let me relate a, a story of how powerful this thing is for a uh, you know a walking dead reductionist materialist like me uh <laughs> doing demos but I'm I'm still an ex I'm an explanationist. I'm wanting to find explanations. So, are you ready for this? Uh, yeah. So this was a, this is an example of 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 how uh, what I've experienced walking through life for 45, 50 years since I was about ten. So when I was about ten or eleven, I thought, okay, if I walk out of the house. And I have to give uh, a thing that I borrowed back to another boy. And I walk out of the house and I, I'm nervous about it. Like I'm thinking, he could be mad at me if I can't find him and give it back to him. What if he's already mad at me? What if I should be afraid to walk out of the house because I've had this thing of his for too long? And, and I'm worried. And I walk down the street. I never find the boy. And I'm just worried the whole time. And, and kind of, I, I noticed that my field, my consciousness, and everything around me seemed to be shaky. Birds weren't even coordinated. They were colliding and, you know, kind of things like that. And so then I would go back to the house and say, okay, we're going to shift modes. Because I can sense that there's a thing outside of me. There's a thing that can guide me. I've always sort of felt it, but I'm now going to, I'm old enough that I'm going to test it. So I'd walk out of the house in a different state, like, I am listening. I am listening for signs. I walk along the street and suddenly it turns my body and makes me go down the alley. And then I'm going on this whole magical mystery tour. Now I'm at the slough. Now I'm sitting down and doing X. And I've still got this thing I need to give back to this, this, this boy. And I'm just, I'm on an adventure and I'm being moved around by intuition or by a force. I'm appreciating all of it. And then suddenly in the distance on the sky, schoolyard across i see the boy and i wave i mean even i mean like i said to the synchronous field or whatever it is just operate me because i don't want my concern about this boy to come through because i knew that even at that point that dogs could detect fear in a person so there was something mm -hmm. going on that was extra sensory that was like some kind of communication grid because dogs could detect when you're afraid of them every kid knows that right and, and so I, I, I went back to a different state and I put my hand up so it would cast a brightness and a brightness to the boy. That was what I was supposed to do. 
the feel like moving me. And then he came over, or we came right up to each other. And I lifted up and I had the thing to give to him. And he had this great grin. It's like, it's so good to meet you today. I was just thinking of you and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, oh, thanks for the object. You, you want it, you can keep it because I like, have another one. And, <laughs> and I had it wrong, right? I had it wrong that he needed it back. And, you know, is it like a pocket watch that I borrowed or something like that? And anyway, we just went on a walk and we became such good friends. I mean, it was... So I I would do this over and over, and I became trusting in this field. I said, this is more intelligent than the, my little 11-year-old brain. It's a big system, and if I trust in it, it's always going to guide me. And uh, it has all, all this time. And I was just doing A, B comparisons and decide which system to rely on, which OS to run for my lifetime. So in, in a sense... Uh, you know, is that woo? I don't know. It, it certainly works if it's woo. Well, it strikes me that what you've managed to do is to kind of run two operating systems simultaneously uh, so that you can shift gears when when it becomes necessary to be a materialist, which, you know, you're in biomedical engineering and materialism works very well for that. Uh, but when you're uh, dealing with uh, other Deeper issues, uh, self-exploration, exploring, you know, the inner cosmos, looking, looking at, uh, what the Buddha was trying to point out to people and, and what the early shamanistic traditions are trying to tell us. Well, materialism has its limits when, when it comes to that. And so you shift gears. That's, seems like a very wise approach. And, and you know, Jeff, I also merge them completely. Mm -hmm. So, in the quest to solve the riddle of the origin of life, that was done in an intuitive, field-connected way. You know, Einstein yeah. called him his Gedanken experimenter when he would just let himself be taken over by the dream or the vision. You know, so he was very mystical and trippy. And so yeah. from age, age 14, I was applying my scientific interests. I was merging them with one system, one, one tool set. And I call it being on the liminal ridge, kind of like right in here. If you can dance on this little ridge between, in a sense, the material or the, some people would call it the mundane, I think that's kind of, things aren't really mundane at any level, uh, and the magical or the mystical, and you're on that liminal ridge between them, perfectly balanced between them. So that one movement and one can shift you toward the other, and then you are in this exquisite magic state. And then you shift back and you take some of that magic to the material, and you test it out in the material, and then you take the material back to the magic and say, let's work on this. And that's what I've done now for 20 years, re-consistently. Re so how did life begin? You know, That was a, a dance on that liminal ridge of, taking molecular mm -hmm. models and combinatorial models into a magic space and asking if this works, is, is, is this the way we were made? And then mm -hmm. taking the insights back and testing them out in this world. And, and so, in a sense, it's one practice, you know. And, and you've been able to apply that same balancing act really, to uh, simultaneously explore four or five different disciplines, which is really an enormous accomplishment. I can imagine that uh, at, at some level, at, at the uh, peak performance that you've shown now for decades, that, you know, these issues dating back to your childhood are, are going to also want to come up and be addressed. Yeah, and this sort of brings us to uh, a, a big topic for me, uh, which is why I went on various healing paths in the 80s, uh, a kind of encounter group. You know, we've all been through this. We're old enough that we remember encounter groups and emotional release. Mm -hmm. And then in the 90s, uh, different different practices and then and theogenic practices and then shamanic practices and now the luminous practice. Um, because in... By the middle 80s, I'd say, I realized that if I looked down, 
if I wasn't so mental, I started feeling my insides. There was a hard knot, really hard, painful knot, really deep down at my core that I, I found. And I had built a, a hard shell over myself where I couldn't really feel emotion. So the encounter groups helped. I, I hadn't cried in 10 years. You know, and I, there wasn't, I was a doer, not a, a beer, really. I was a very good doer because I was writing code. I mean, when you're writing code, you're in a, you're in a flow uh, that really doesn't have much emotion unless you, there's a bug you can't find or something. <laughs> this frustration you can blow up suddenly because you get yourself so exhausted when you're writing enormous code sets, which is what I was, I was doing. This hard knot inside of me was, uh, I realized I had to look at it. I had to look at it. It was, it was something that was blocking flow. It was something that didn't feel good. And I was concerned about it. And that was the beginning. And that was maybe when I was 23, 24, that kind of thing. Um, and it turns out that after all these years, it was really the unborn embryo of me. Mm-hmm. And one one night I was able to, to birth that embryo. Uh, and really the flow then began. Uh, and the embryo was unborn for one very clear reason, that uh, when I was in utero, my my parents, my biological parents, decided they had to give me up because they were just too poor. My biological father had been a... a basically worked on the British Columbia ferries and been a captain, whatnot, or he's, he's actually going to become a sea captain later, uh, was poor. He'd lost his job at a filling station, you know, and this was hard times. This is 1961. Uh, there was no birth control. Um, there was really no women's rights. It was a fairly tough society, really, straight right out of the 50s. So he lost his job, and they were just impoverished. They, both of them were trying to live on their own in Victoria, British Columbia. <clears throat> and they, I had to be given up. And I felt that. My my being, whatever it was, I, I, I think it was about four months, maybe five months uh, in, in term, uh, that I felt the love connection that had been there as an embryo in in the womb feels with it's a cradling uh, that the connection was dropped and I really feel that it, it was dropped very clearly because when I later met my biological parents and I met my biological mother she had the capacity to drop connections pretty easily mm-hmm. I think her trauma was extremely severe her dissociative disorder that actually she has a triggerable dissociative disorder uh, very, very clear on the surface. So when I was no longer to be, I was dropped. And the embryo felt it. So that when I came out, part of me knew I was coming out alone. So I built a capsule around myself. And I've been through now uh, several angles or points of view of experiencing my birth, my conception, the growth, and my birth, and then into infancy when my biological parents came and picked me up my mother looked in my eyes and her comment was years later you were in your own world you were in your own world so i was this being that was already deeply internally connecting because that's where i resourced but i was not making eye contact uh for you know i'm sure that eventually i did but i was I would have been called, you know, I would have been on the spectrum or autistic, autistic or Asperger's child, but there was no such classification in those years. Uh, and I was, yeah, I was deeply internal, but my, my consciousness deeply uh, wandered in the world. And I think that it started to wander because it was searching for the love that dropped. So I was, in a sense, realming, as we call it in Luminous. Uh, I was realming to look for that. Con- that love that, that left. And that became my, in a sense, a, a kind of skill or superpower that my consciousness can realm very widely throughout the solar system and into time, into small space. It can do a lot of 
it's it can entertain the little being it can carry the being now in in this whole process the healing of that hard knot was i had to rebirth myself and i had to do it multiple times uh, using multiple tools until that self was birthed in in love and in connection i had to raise that self again and this was quite a process so that i could come into union with a self that was now remade and then that not dissolved or was, is no longer there. Yeah. I have the impression that uh, at, at an instinctive age you realized that you had lost your parents and you've spent much of your life sort of rediscovering yourself as a child of the universe. Yeah. I'd say that's pretty accurate. Um, There's another uh, incredible experience that came back to me very vividly about 15 years ago, which was the the turning on of my vision. So in the stages of the making of this being called Bruce, there was a stage when I was in the adoption ward for about 12 days. And that stage was very, very uh, critical to my development. Normally in that period, the, the parents and the mother is holding the baby and resourcing the baby. And there's the smells and the voice and the reassurance. It's incredibly important at that time. You know, Stan Groff talks a lot about this, this critical postnatal, neonatal period. And I was wrapped up in an adoption ward with probably a hundred other crying babies. Uh, for some reason, the sound of pouring water is extremely upsetting to me. And I think that it went back to that that sound of, of water being poured was happening then. And it was one of the only sort of identifiable sounds in the room. But it wasn't identified with a kind of a caring thing. It was just sort of a, a sound. And it probably ties into deep, a, a deep thing. But uh, that what happened to me when I was sort of pulling out this deep memory as I saw these bars, I saw these these black and white shapes uh, in the state that I was in, in this reconstructing state. Uh, and then suddenly they resolved into a three-dimensional mesh like that. And my consciousness started turning. And it was a basically the crib... <laughs> It was the actual crib, and it was my 3D vision turning on. Because little babies, they don't have color vision coming right away, and they don't have three-dimensional oh. depth vision. That's why people hang those things that a little child can sort of try to look at first and reach, and they establish depth <clears throat> and color perception. But it turned on. It was vivid. And, and my, when that happened, when the 3D renderer turned on, my consciousness actually spiraled in this dream, if you could call that, spiraled out of the crib through the top of the hospital. You could see the whole hospital down below and out to the limb of the earth. There was this glowing limb of the earth where my consciousness said, that is where I am. This mm -hmm. is where I've come into. And then it came back down in, into the being. It checked it out. Now, I don't know if this is, it was such a powerful sort of reconstruction that came back de novo. Uh, I don't know if that's what happens or if that's simply a metaphor. But it was another stage in my coming into the, this, this universe as a, as we uh -huh. are all ch childs of the universe. It was one of that, the first moments. Well, it sounds, as you describe it, it feels like an authentic memory that bubbled up. It really does. Um, there was one that happened just after that that shaped me. So this turning on a vision occurred, and then I was at a funny kind of an angle. And, you know, infants don't can't even turn over, or they can't turn themselves over. But somehow, suddenly in front of me was something that I called the black-eyed baby. Hmm. And it was another baby. Uh I didn't know what it was, so in, in this in this particular state, it was suddenly just a face with black eyes that were looking at me, and it was the most terrifying thing I ever see, seen. And it was the first being that I had encountered. 
And I realized this is the first entity that I encountered. So in, in the world that I was in, there was no other beings. It was just me. I had been in the womb and now I was in this very uncertain place that made no sense. And I wasn't particularly, or maybe I wasn't connecting with the, the nurses that were just picking up the babies and turning them and doing, and giving great care to the babies because they knew what the babies were going through. And so care and love was happening and babies were being fed and, but they're being fed, you know, from bottles and things like this. But this first being that I saw was another baby. And the other baby, for me, it felt like an attack. It felt like the most frightening thing I had ever seen was these black eyes, these piercing eyes searching. And it caused me to collapse and, and go inward because I had no idea what it was and what to do about it. Because I had no referent. There's no language. There's no nothing. It was just a recoiling and a panic. And it led me to be very non-visual, not making eye contact very easily at all. Um, and it was a source of my tendency on the spectrum that it, it took quite a while to, it took another intense experience to be able to make eye contact comfortably with, with people at all. Um, mm. But so the recovery of where it started was this. And as I came to the realization of this is why I can't make eye contact, um, I realized that little baby was as uncertain and probably seeing me had the same response. What is mm -hmm. going on? You know, I, and I had empathy for, for the baby and it melted that whole system. And because you can repattern uh, your past effectively, um, and that was a huge insight and release from, and, and a knowing. If you have an understanding, this is where my reductionism comes in and my materialism. If you have an, a, a deep understanding of the events that patterned you, a knowing, a real knowing, uh, you can they can reorganize quickly. Uh, if they remain a mystery, sort of shrouded and buried under layers of protectors and managers and coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not in their purity because there's all this structure that builds around a personality to protect you from mm -hmm. deep, deep traumas and experience that is uncovered by numerous practices. But when you have the knowing, the, the, the wisdom or the knowing of, of how and why, you can really make, make a move. Well, that may be reductionistic, but you're reducing down to knowing, down to a mental event. And, and I totally agree with you, uh, on, on that, that, that bringing these things into the light of consciousness can, uh, be very powerful. And, and it's very rare that a person can go that deep within themselves to recover, uh, an event that took place when you were just a few days old. Yeah. And it, is it a metaphor? Is it real? But in a sense, then I go back to what happened on Sunday. It was an intelligent field giving me just what I needed to reduce my suffering. So if there was anything, so what a loving and caring thing. So was it real? Was it what really happened? It may not have been. It may not be, because the event is in the past. It's actually not recoverable. The past isn't, doesn't exist anymore. So the, but the patterning given was precisely the patterning, patterning to unravel the condition and reduce my suffering. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether it is true to what happened, you know, back then. That I often tell people, uh, based on personal experiences of my own, very different from yours, but they were instrumental in my becoming the person I am now. And what I often say to people is that when you strive to become the best version of yourself, the whole universe will reach out to help you. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there's a saying, uh, is it when you have a closely held dream, you probably know this one, when you hold a dream so closely and dearly, then the whole universe lines up to make it make it come to be or something, something like that, that people have it on their walls yeah. in their kitchen. 
I, I'm not familiar with that saying, but it is very much in alignment with, with what I'm saying to you. And, you know, another thing struck me, and that is your life is uh, almost like a super person because you're accomplished in so many different areas, major areas, not just little areas, but big areas, and several of them simultaneously. It's like a, a super heroic life that you've lived. And I, in thinking about superheroes, I realize many of them, Superman and Batman and many of the other classical superheroes that we've grown up with were orphans. And that is interesting. Yeah. That is really, really interesting. Uh, and, and these days I'm meeting more and more ad uh, ado adoptees uh, as I tell this story and I hear their experiences of, of being capsules in the universe on their own. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're special. You know, in, in some ways it, it can be a hard road. It's a hard road because because in effect, I, I saw the other side. I went through the other side because I met my biological parents and family, mm -hmm. my full blood brothers and sisters back in my late twenties into my thirties. And I, I went into the womb of the family. I returned to that and could feel what it was like to be with my bio sister. And I still, I know her and I love her to this day and my biological brother. And I had a second sister who, passed away of a brain tumor that I knew for two years. When I'm with them, I feel different. I'm a different human being. And it, it, it happens in an instant. And it's, it's the nature and nurture thing. And so I can feel what it would have been like to be in the family, but I didn't go through the trauma of uh, the conditions of the family. At that time, I was spared it. And they all say, you were the lucky one. Yeah. You... <laughs> you were really lucky. <laughs> That's quite interesting. Your story reminds me a little bit of uh, Evan Alexander. I think you may know him and uh, about his past life journey. He was also an orphan, and uh, he believed that while he was in a, a deep coma state, not akin to a near-death state, he uh, w was in a very deep coma, and in that state he visited a heavenly-like realm and met a being who was a guide that he got to know rather well, because it seemed like weeks. And, and, and uh, when he came out uh, and met, again, his biological parents, he discovered the picture of a sister, a biological sister of his who had died, that he felt sort of an instantaneous closeness with while he was in a coma state. Wow, and he met them after the coma. He hadn't met them Well, she, had, she was already deceased. He only saw her picture, but he felt like he had encountered her in this out-of-body state. Well, it brings up an interesting question about life after death, which is really the the most difficult problem of all for a materialist. Yeah, and in some ways, see, you're right. I mean, I, I compartmentalize, but I see it as a gradient. Like way over here in materialism and everything, we're really good, and we actually have to be good or trains fall off train tracks, things like that. That's right. And then we go, and then we have a spectrum that we go along, and we go along, and we go along, and we're crossing into this realms that are bigger than human consciousness, bigger than human mentation and science and engineering, and they're huge spaces. And our dear friend Nick Herbert described this beautifully when his consciousness was opened in the 60s, realizing that uh, consciousness is so much larger than the enterprise of science, for example. But what Nick did is he, he came back from that incredibly expanded view and, and union with something so enormous for a kid from Ohio, you know, from an all-American town in Ohio to experience that and then come back down, came back down and did decades of beautiful science. But he held that state no matter anyway and he held that dialogue and he sort of calls it quantum tantra i think that is his name for yeah. it. he held that that conversation but he's still going to want to have uh you know a physicist explanation for certain problems so 
it, it, it's in a way if you can hold both and you can go back and forth you can be quite grounded if you only live in in the magic and spirit realm unless you're very skilled or like a shaman or shamaness you can get really off center quickly especially in yeah. the in the in the worlds of uh suburban you know consumer society <laughs> if you yeah. if you stay in the world of the hardcore materialist reductionist it's all just you know you can become quite pessimistic and quite uh it's a diet that's fairly uh, mm -hmm. it's like thin gruel actually in a way mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and and in science you there are people whose whose very lifeblood is drained out by the the uh, vicissitudes of of the difficulty of the work you know the b laboratory bench work is difficult just the yeah. grind of this thing and it's all just nuts and bolts and it just drains people uh and they find not only solace but insight and regeneration by going into the other magisteria that has been called over time uh but you can use that magisteria to help your science, and you can use the science to teach the magisteria. So one of the th things I've done in my life is I've realized that that great big intelligence, if you will, is quite amorphous. And sometimes it needs focus. And so with I have the, the wonderful tool of a focusing attention. And I can focus my attention into that field or to that field and say, we need more of your focused attention, please. Pay attention and, and come up with more synchronous events, please. Cause our species is accelerating and you have to accelerate too. You, we just need more of you, whoever you are, big thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I'm in that space, I do teachings of that big thing. I say, mm -hmm. this is how we are. This is how we are made. This is how we operate. Pay attention. Watch this demonstration of how humans have organized their world so that you can know us better. Because I figure, you know what, it's, if it's a great big amorphous field, does it have a proper bookkeeping system? No. You know, it's a thing of its own that is made up of all of us and maybe all of the living world, but it can be fashioned into, into much more of a consciousness that we can have relate to and that we can become in partnership with. And, and I can give you one example of, a, if you'd like, another story. Of yeah, this. sure. Has, so this is about two years ago. I was up on Skyline Drive up here near, uh, on the, it's the ridge, it's the liminal ridge between the magic of the Pacific Ocean and its glow off the San Francisco, uh, Santa Cruz Mountains. And, and, yeah. and that's the magical, that's, that that light is so powerful. That was the light that shone through Big Sur at, at, on Esalen, for example. It's an incredible glow, and you see the marine layer and the trees. And then you're on this ridge called Skyline, Skyline Drive, and you look down. It's the it's the total materialist world of Stanford University and NASA Ames and Google and Facebook and Apple and the, in a grid, right? So that yeah. Skyline area is the liminal ridge between these worlds. So I go there a lot, and that's one of the reasons I moved to here to Boulder Creek is to be able to go up to this magical place. So I'm I'm up there to do a hike, and I'm feeling particularly good. I leave my bloody phone in the car so that I'm not distracted, so I can be present. And I walk up the the heights of uh, Skyline Ridge, and I get to the point where I said, "Okay, now is the time. I'm going to turn and face." the synchronous field and i'm going to say to the field thank you for all your guidance over these years since i was so little thank you for helping me to go on my path because i also know it's your path because you are working for our benefit so that we may survive so that we may get through our challenges because we are such miracles in the cosmos we're so we're we're precious you know like church lady special we're you know whatever we're we're remarkable we're a remarkable yeah. creation and so we have this remarkable attention that maybe is all from all of us so i i said i'm dropping i'm i'm dropping my veil i'm dropping the veil to you i see you 
I see you. And I was looking out into the, the glowing woods and say, I know you're there. I know what you're doing. And I will follow. I'm your faithful follower. I'm your faithful soldier in this march or of life or something. And suddenly, in, in my third eye, opened this field, opened uh, basically a, a glowing square pattern. It was shimmering, very, very potent. And basically, we beheld each other through this. I see you. I recognize you. And I just basically wanted to do that. Just let's just drop it now and let's directly contact each other. And then it, it blinked out of existence. And then from that point on, when I was walking, I was in this exquisite state of connectedness. Like every bird, every sound, I was guided, just like when I was 9, 10, 11 years old, but in a beautifully connected uh, state. And I get up to the top of the ridge, and I look over, and there's the Wallace Stegner bench, named after a famous uh, poet in uh, at Stanford. And I go over to that bench. And I start sitting down, and then my body is shifted to the right. Boom. Okay, I'm sitting on the right side of the bench because I'm tied into being guided. And about three minutes later, up behind me bustles uh, three people, three older people, two two uh, ladies and a man. They bustle on over, and because they see that I'm on the right side of the bench, they feel drawn to the bench, and they say, "Oh, can we can we sit here?" And I said, "Well, sure, you know." And, and can we eat our lunch? You know, <laughs> Jerry, you can eat your lunch. And so they're eating their lunch. And somehow we got around to talking about uh, ourselves. And it turns out he's, a, I can think, a professor somewhere. I kind of got that. And it was his wife and her best friend. And just wonderful people, probably in their late 60s. The kind of people who just you just love to hang out with. And I told them about what I was working on and the origin of life uh, at UC Santa Cruz. And we, we just had some major publications and everything. And then I remembered that two weeks before, I'd been in front of a group of postdocs at a big conference. And I had said to them, you know, guys, this work, there's at least a half a dozen Nobel Prizes in this work, if you take it up. Uh, if you work on this diligently and they are, that to get their attention, like, oh, there's a half dozen Nobel Prizes coming through this this work. And I would love to be the fuddy-duddy, gray-haired, old guy, funny old guy in the back of the room in, you know, Stockholm while you are getting those Nobel Prizes, or at least one of you. I'd love to be present with and, and to witness that. You know, I, I, I just described this to these three Describe these three wonderful people. And the man looked up and he said, that's what I'm doing next week. He said, really? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm flying to Stockholm. I'm the fuddy-duddy guy in the back of the room in the tuxedo. Everyone has to wear a tuxedo. Everyone looks like a penguin. When their tuxedo is provided by the Nobel organization, uh, fitted to you in your hotel room. And my student is getting the Nobel Prize. And it's the second time this has happened. It's the second wow. student, and he's in his mid fifties mm -hmm. or, or, or early fifties, and it's in economics. It was the second mm -hmm. time, and it was like, wow. And I left them. I became friends with them. I go to their Christmas party every year now. But mm -hmm. I was wa I was walking back down the mountain, and I turned back to the field. This this great thing. I said, "You rock." That was such a powerful. <laughs> That that was such a powerful demo of your of your capability. Yeah. When you think of when you think about that, I have this thought about doing this. I have this connection. They're lined up, right? What is the probability? The probability is virtually zero for this to happen, mm -hmm. right? And it and yet it happens. And there's this perfect intersection. And this idea comes, and they are. He's the only person in. The United mm -hmm. States that is their very next week going to do the thing that I had the vision for two weeks before, and I meet them, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. the feel. That is its power. It's 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 delivery power. It's predictive power. It's reliable uh, power. So, you know, it's just another. It's like me trying to give the 
thing back to the little boy. Uh, it's mm-hmm. just the same stuff, but it's it's vastly accelerated since 1971 or whatever it was. It's it's vastly uh, more densely connected now. So mm-hmm. the, the field is uh, rocking it. So if you're looking at the history of of the known physical universe, what I'm hearing you say is that synchronicities have been increasing since the beginning, and they're really reaching an intense peak right now, which uh, provides, uh, one would have to say, magical opportunities for people who are aware of what's going on. Yeah, and, and so the engineer in me, a couple of years ago, asked the question, how can we formalize this and use this as a tool? And what is going on? You know, Terrence, back in the day, Terrence McKenna used to say, what is going on? You know, (laughs) for him, a lot was going on, um, but um, much of the time. Uh, But uh, so I came up with this model that if you put intention out so that, remember how we were talking about how the, the stacking of the sun rising every morning and going through this engine that stacks yes, evolution yes. and probability, probability, and we're at this huge probability potential gradient. We're sitting on the top yes. of the, that gradient. And that gradient is a potential field. It is the field. It is the synchronous field. But it's not only... It's a wafting of, poten- of probabilities so that you're in a space where extremely improbable events are happening all the time. And then there's yep. a network effect. There's a network effect and there's a gigantic memory system. And if that isn't the definition of a powerful synchronous field, I don't know what is. It's just so large that we can't write formulas for it and say, well, it's, it starts here and it ends there and it has this shape and color and everything. No, we're, we are it. We're in it. And so it's really, it's really high. It's way up here. And so then I said, how does the mechanism work? And for the SAND conference uh, a couple of years ago in my SAND 2017 talk, I proposed it from that that vision of how we were made. I think that I might have yeah. said that in the previous show. There is another mechanism that if you project a vision, a strongly held dream or vision, you use your imagination to uh, to view beautiful outcomes like, I'm going to make this fantastic quilt or learn to be a dancer or do such and such, or it actually shapes future probability just in front of you. So your intention that's held beautifully and closely without sort of nervousness and shakiness, it's held very clearly, clear-eyed intention, shapes probability so that events that lead to the outcome start rolling like marbles down into a valley in front of you. And when run rolls down, your intention has created an uh the attention on the probabilistic field and it creates an action and the marble is there and if you pick up the marble like playing doom or duke nukem or something and put it in your pocket (laughs) or do 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 the action that the marble and and trust trust in that then the the probability is shaped ahead of that and shaped ahead of that and sometimes there's branch points you pick up these marbles and it shapes and shapes and shapes and shapes and shapes and shapes until you reach this stupendous outcome. And so for the sand talk, which we can put in the feed, for me it led to going from seeing the vision of the, the moving marbles, the, the molecules in the air, all the way to the origin of life uh, hypothesis and then the testing mm-hmm. and meeting Dave. And, and, the example, here's, here's an example. So I moved to Boulder Creek, Santa Cruz Mountains in 1994. 1998, mm-hmm. I buy this farm. It has a huge barn. Huge barn. Like, why did I buy a farm with a huge barn? I suddenly get obsessed with collecting vintage computer hardware. And I'd been interested in Xerox Park because I'd written some of the first graphical interface software in the 80s for PCs based on Xerox and Xerox Park with their help. Um, and so... I get obsessed, and by 2000, 2001, the barn is getting filled with vintage computers, and it's just craziness. Just, I'm building the hugest website to tell the whole history of computing. I don't, like, this isn't part of my path, is it? You know, but no, I'm obsessed. I've been given this mission, and I love it, and 
I held the opening in 2013 with Galen. She, she and I put together the opening, and 300 people showed up, and we had, by that time, just in, the, in two years, I had a Cray supercomputer, I had Xerox networks working, I had L chairs, and, and a fantastic collection just poured in. Computer uh, museum in the barn. Were what they happened? operational? A lot could be. Uh, you couldn't operate. Some of them were just dead as doornails, but people yeah. showed up to fix them. It was like a huge synchronous thing. But that yeah. wasn't the end of it. So that was the best possible outcome for creating a computer museum. I mean, William Shatner shot for four days and beamed me into the cray for a show called How William Shatner Changed the World. It was on History Channel and Discovery Channel. <laughs> people seen it. That's all about Star Trek and how it predicted the future that then came. Mm. So, mm. but the, the key thing was in 2009 when Dave Deemer, who had moved into the Santa Cruz Mountains at pre precisely the same year that I had, saw an article in the paper about a crazy guy that had a crazy supercomputer in his barn somewhere in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And he happened to ask uh, another professor in the Department of Chemistry uh, about this. And she said, we know that guy. Would you like to come to dinner? And <laughs> I, I went to dinner and I met Dave. And uh, it was the, the most brilliant partnership. This meeting, that moment meeting Dave was the open the door to the sort of life work and insight. Yeah. And so yeah. by following the marble of crazy, I lost my marbles collecting these vintage computers, it, it led to that one little thing that was going to connect me with David Deemer that led to this miraculous final stretch of the outcome. And so it's, it's all those doggone marbles, you know. <laughs> what a wonderful story. I'm I'm impressed. Of course, I met Dave Deemer long before that. I met him uh, back in the late 1970s, as I recall. But uh, what uh, he's the perfect guy for you. Yeah, an inquiring mind. You know, and the, was it the Consciousness Research Group in Berkeley or something that you guys were both in? We used to hobnob around with with several groups, and he was at, if I remember rightly, at UC Davis then in. Uh, teaching biology, and then he moved to Santa Cruz, and I visited him there as as well. He was r really, ever since I've known him, a wonderful man and very helpful to me starting out as a graduate student in parapsychology. He, he was just a, a great friend. He's a complete gentleman, and so mm -hmm. the, the fortune that I have is there are very few gentlemen scientists or gentlewoman scientists left because they can't be. I mean, the system doesn't reward that. And so here's this man who's not retired, but is a research professor, but very uh, uh, well, highly regarded in the field. And he would spend the time with me, six years of having tea in his house twice a month to, so that he could educate me on the whole field, the politics, and give me papers to read and the chemistry and everything so that I could fashion my sort of visionary systems approach with his solid chemistry, 50 years of work, into a single hypothesis that, that we developed together. Mm -hmm. In fact, we yeah. just published two weeks ago an interview review article on Dave's history, and I did the questions, and he had these beautiful answers illustrated in a special edition of a, the journal Life uh, commemorating his 80th birthday, which was just back on the 21st of April. And there's all these other oh. art articles now mm -hmm. coming into this commemorative issue. And I can send that to the listeners too, so they can I learn would, about Dave. Yes, yes, we'll put it. We'll put all of that in the comments section under under this video, and maybe uh, Dave would be willing to be interviewed as well. I'd love to have him on the channel. I'm sure he would. Yeah, I'm sure he'd uh -huh. be delighted to to come back. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really a, a nice connection that you've had. And I have to say, Bruce, you've really opened up tonight. I have seen a whole different side of you that I wasn't quite aware of before. It's wonderful. You have a big heart. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. It's, um, well, you do too. And the fact that you have listened to so many people over the years and internalized uh, their 
uh, systems, the systems of the world. And in fact, I was just watching Bernardo Kostrup's uh, oh, yeah. talk with you, and he's an amazing being too. I just um, I've had the honor of being on a couple of podcasts with him and in conversation with him, and uh, such a beautifully motivated and passionate person in in his exploring mm-hmm. his own realms. Well, this has been a, a delightful conversation. It makes me just look forward all the more to the future because I have a feeling, Bruce, that you and I can take these conversations into new territory for both of us. That would be, uh, I think, not only fascinating for us, but for the viewers as well. And perhaps uh, in a subsequent conversation, I can talk a little bit more about what could be some of the front edge of the healing arts and the the awakening arts, if you call them, that I'm I'm now sort of training in, and all the mm-hmm. the all the uh, the parts, the little wounded parts, and the systems that operate people, yeah. and learning how to scan those and to highly empathize with those, and mm-hmm. how to allow those to heal themselves, just as what happened to me on on last Sunday, you know, and the the beauty of that. And this is what was explained to us, and I'll finish with this. Uh, and Lisa's explained to us that if we could go there, if we can go to self to self, Dharmakaya, if that's what I may have the term wrong, but where it's you in relationship to your parts, in relationship to this huge synchronous field that is guiding, in relationship to being open to tell total energy and self reorganization, you don't need a practitioner with you. You don't need a teacher. So in one level, it takes the workload down uh, and it allows uh, beings that are coming into the program to actually do their work rapidly and come into this clarity and healing and uh, uh, super rapidly. And I think if it removes whole levels from the healing arts and the, the I don't know what you call all, all this feel, all this striving, all this techniques and methods and things like this, removes that because it's a self-to-self practice and and you can resource your your own system this way but you can also connect this way with this huge thing and perhaps it's an accelerator so if people can learn that doorway in then they can roll we can roll through society millions billions of people potentially could roll into these uh these states these transformed states you know and i think it's what the Tibetan Buddhists have been calling for, for you know, we need 10,000 Buddhists, but mm-hmm. maybe we could just start with two or three or just one, you uh-huh. know. <laughs> yeah, but, because uh, I, I think when you were describing your experience last Sunday, and uh, hopefully maybe in the future we can just talk about that in, in some depth, uh, I was thinking, you know what, I'm going to title this program Universal Love. That's what it's about. It really is, you know, and, Mm-hmm. I certainly, uh, you know, Jeffrey, I see that in your face every time I see you. I see universal love there. That's why I was named Mishlove. You were named Mishlove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that your given name or is that a name? That you... yeah, no, it's a family name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And it, it, what meaning does it have in the... One day, I was thinking about my name, Jeffrey Mishlove, and I began chanting to myself a mantra, and I took the name Jeffrey, and I thought, well, that's like Godfrey, Mishlove, my love, Godfrey, my love, and I was chanting this mantra as I, as I was walking down, uh, I think it was 25th Avenue in San Francisco, where I lived at the time. And as I was chanting the mantra, uh, a car goes by, and it's my friend Ray Stubbs waving out the window at me. Ray Stubbs was a teacher of uh, tantric mysticism, <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> it's the synchronous field again. Yeah, That, yeah. that wonderful field that... Uh, yeah. God, God, free, mish love, my love. Uh, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I had translated my name into the mantra: "God, free, my love." <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Well, Bruce, this, I'm so high talking to you. <laughs> I can I can tell this is this is uh, the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It truly is. And uh, yeah. let's continue, and uh, we can we can get geeky again. Thank you once again from the bottom of my heart. This has just been a magnificent time with you. Blessings. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.